Hello, hi. Welcome back to our latest chapter in Southampton Reviews in Cardiothoracic Surgery. In this chapter, we will be discussing cardiac biochemistry. Before we start, I would like to thank our supervisors for this chapter, Professor Sonal Ori, our clinical lead and lead for education, Mr. Ahmed Mustafa Umran, consultant cardiac surgeon, as well as Mr. Suvatesh Luthra, our senior surgical fellow. As usual, we'll start with the mind map, table of contents. We will be as conservative as possible in tackling this topic. After all, lecturing surgeons about biochemistry is a sin. I hope you forgive me for that. When I started preparing this chapter, um, I, wasn't, um, um, I wasn't planning to make it as a separate standalone chapter. However, going more and more into this topic, as well as reading more and more into it, I discovered how we can easily relate it to our day-to-day -day activities. Nevertheless, our discussion will focus predominantly on areas of clinical and or exam applications. We are not here to discuss pure basic science topics. Otherwise, I would have been banished from the secret league of surgeons. Instead, we'll cover only information that can be traced to a clinical situation you will encounter in your practice or a potential exam question you might come across in your preparations. For instance, let's start our uh, videos. For instance, by the end of this chapter, you will be able to answer the following questions. Why normally the heart muscle does not get cramps? When does the heart get cramps and how? This can be correlated to anginas. I understand the word cramp is a bit strange in here. Uh, this could be correlated to anginas or could also refer to low cardiac output states postoperative. We could also answer what is ischemic preconditioning, myocardial hibernation and stunning. Why is the heart refractory to ionotropes in acidotic, hypoxic, and septic conditions? We all know that, but we don't know what is the theoretical basis behind that. We will also discuss operating on special patient groups, such as ischemic, hypertrophic hearts, diabetic, and obese patients. In addition, we will be able to discuss a few topics of pure exam significance. You may or may not come across one or two MCQ questions tackling this uh, particular subject. Um, I hope by covering this topic, you will not get any trouble answering these questions, such as substrate fuel, ATP expenditure, transporters, energy stores, and so on. You know, those kind of MCQs you, are, you, you, you take for given that they are not going to be answered. Hopefully, after um, discussing this chapter, you will be able to answer these questions very easily. Let's start with ATP production and expenditure. Understanding ATP economics explains the physiological basis of angina and postoperative low cardiac output states post cardiac surgery. Like any other muscle, there are two sources for ATP aerobic and anaerobic mechanisms. This is for any muscle. There are, however, certain unique features which privilege the myocardium. First of all, the aerobic mechanisms are substantially overwhelming the anaerobic mechanism. As you can see here, with this braided uh, rope, the, the bigger element is always the aerobic mechanisms. This is, of course, for a reason. That is to say, avoid the formation of lactate during periods of exercise. Otherwise, you will get cramps in your heart muscle every time you go for a run and spend a few days of heartache after a marathon, for instance. This, of course, only happens in skeletal muscles, in skeletal muscles. Net, it never happens in cardiac muscles. Also, ATP production and expenditure are linked. Accordingly, the ATP pool remains more or less constant, even during periods of maximal exertion. Your heart beats constantly, even during sleep, whereas skeletal muscles are subject to fatigue, which reflects the depletion of ATP pool. This never happens in cardiac muscle. However, if that's the case, then how come we can suffer angina, preoperative or low cardiac output states postoperative? Essentially, you inadvertently deplete your ATP stores. It's not meant to be. It happens by accident. The ATP pool could be depleted during open heart surgery or ischemia. In the former, cross-clamping the aorta without switching off ATP expenditure consumes your ATP pool, such as when surgeons inadvertently overrun the cardioplasic times. Or in case of incomplete cardiopulmonary bypass, for instance, which um, um, leads to rewarming and distension. This predisposes to low cardiac output states postoperatively. In ischemia, the blood supply is abruptly cut off while the heart is beating and consuming the precious ATP 
which manifests as angina, preoperative and low cardiac output state postoperative. This also explains why in our day-to-day -day practice, we see a lot of surgeons prefer to wait for a variable period of time after myocardial infarction before operating. Essentially, we are trying to allow time for the myocardium to restore the ATP stores. ATP expenditure in the myocardium is equally significant. 70% is spent on contraction, 20% on the ionic status and ion channels. The last 10% is spent on miscellaneous tasks. I personally call these miscellaneous tasks as housekeeping tasks such as repairing damaged ultrastructures, restoring intracellular homeostasis, maintaining cellular integrity, and so on. This explains why postoperatively, the myocardium is refractory to ionotropes in the presence of hypoxia, acidosis, or sepsis. This is simply because more energy will be diverted to the housekeeping tasks, rendering the other um, two tasks short of energy to spend. In other words, you are whipping the heart with ionotropes to increase intracellular calcium. But, this, but there is no ATP free to utilize this calcium in contraction. Instead, the majority of ATP is directed to restoring intracellular homeostasis. This explains the general, why the general rule we always say in the ICU, do not whip a tired horse. What will happen is ultimately you will increase intracellular calcium levels and the cell will have to spend even more ATP to maintain intracellular calcium uh, homeostasis. Next, we'll be talking about substrate fuels, which is a, a, a very interesting. I haven't yet moved into the clinical bit. We are still talking about the basic stuff. Regardless of what the substrate used, they all converge to a common pathway in the mitochondria. All substrates ultimately end up as acetyl-CoA. This in turn enters the citric acid cycle, as you can see here, also known as the Krebs cycle, to generate a variable number of NADH and FADH. This accounts for more than 95% of ATP that is produced. The remaining 5%, on the other hand, is derived directly through substrate phosphorylation, direct for the substrate phosphorylation. The brain in normal circumstances exclusively uses glucose to produce ATP. This is because it is trapped behind a tight barrier allowing only glucose to get through. We are referring to the blood-brain barrier in here. Thus, body organs need to use alternative fuels to save glucose resources for the brain. Other organs and tissues also exhibit exclusivity when it comes to energy sources, such as, for instance, retinal and lens tissues, um, which exclusively use glucose. This also includes the renal medulla tissue and red blood cells. This is either because they lack mitochondria, for instance, like the RBCs and the eye tissues, or have no abundant oxygen to achieve successful, uh, successful oxidative phosphorylation, such as the renal medulla. In the case of the brain, we explained because of the blood-brain barrier, so uh, it's limited to what substrates can pass through, so exclusively it uses glucose. The myocardium, on the other hand, enjoys the ability to use various substrates fuels, as you can see here. Glucose, lactate, fatty acids, ketone bodies, amino acids, they can all be used. Fatty acids represent the cardinal fuel during adult life, and glucose is the cardinal fuel during neonatal life. This is because we always come to the rationale of things here. This is because fatty acids require a higher amount of oxygen to produce ATP, whereas glucose requires less amount. In neonatal life, low oxygen, low oxygen saturations are expected for various reasons, such as PDA, PFOs, lung immaturity, etc. So the heart chooses the less expensive fuel in terms of oxygen. The same rationale explains the use of glucose in ischemic conditions. Also, the heart favors one of the fuels over the other depending on its abundance. For instance, after a fatty meal, the heart utilizes fatty acids more whereas after a carbohydrate meal, glucose will be favorite. Moreover, during fasting, fatty acids derived from adipose tissue is favored over glucose to spare it for the brain. In diabetic obese patients, glucose becomes sequestrated outside the cell due to insulin resistance. Hence, fatty acids are favored. During exercise, lactate is produced in abundance via skeletal muscles, and the heart uses this lactate as energy. Really. 
Finally, in extreme situations of starvation where no glucose and no adipose tissue store fats, the heart reverts to proteins. Usually, this is coupled with a generalized catabolic state manifested with muscle wasting. Also, in extreme situations of diabetic ketoacidosis, the heart can use ketone bodies. This explains why. This list is available in every book, but I think I, I tried in brief to explain the rationale behind using these fuels in different situations. Now we will focus next on the most two significant fuels, which is the glucose and fatty acids. Fatty acids and glucose produce ATP through the processes of beta oxidation and glycolysis, respectively. In short, beta oxidation is the more clean source of energy, whereas glycolysis produces lactate as a waste side product. Beta oxidation produces more ATP. In brief, in glycolysis, the cell starts by, by paying two ATPs just to sequestrate the glucose inside the cell. Then the process of glycolysis pays back four ATPs. Um, um, uh, this ultimately glucose is transformed to pyruvate, then acetyl-CoA that enters the Krebs cycle and uh, produces a maximum of 38 ATPs. Beta oxidation, on the other hand, breaks fatty acids down sequentially, and every cut or break generates more and more ATP. One oxidation cycle yields 14 to 17 ATP. The longer is the fatty acid, the more oxidation cycles are achieved. For instance, the longest uh, fatty acids is the tetracontelic acid, which is uh, uh, formed of 40 uh, carbons. The oxidation of a moderate fatty acid, such as uh, palmitic acid, uh, which is formed of 16 carbons, yields 106 ATP. Accordingly, beta oxidation is more productive and cleaner energy source, but there is a catch beta oxidation requires more oxygen accordingly fatty acids represent the expensive clean fuel whereas glucose represents the cheap waste producing fuel by the waste we refer to lactate now looking at the uh, uh, various metabolic states in aerobic and versus anaerobic conditions this will conclude obviously the the basic science bit and then we can move on to the clinical bit Beta oxidation requires more oxygen, whereas glycolysis can take place even if there is no oxygen at all. If you can see in this animation, um, in the abundance of oxygen, pyruvate will change to lactate in the process of fermentation. In, uh, uh, sorry, in the abundance of oxygen, um, um, uh, beta oxidation and glycolysis will move on uh, normally to produce ATP. Uh, whereas in the absence of oxygen, beta oxidation will be switched off and pyruvate will be turned into lactate in the process of fermentation, producing less amount of ATP. The, um, the, the lactate will be used then uh, in order to produce more ATP. The only case where myocardium shifts to pure lactate production instead of lactate consumption are during ischemic uh, situation, in which anaerobic conditions will prevail. This will manifest as muscle cramp between brackets angina and fatigue post-operative that is referred to as low cardiac output states angina will be due to lactate accumulation among other mechanisms of course fatigue on the other hand reflects the less abundant source of energy as the heart now will have to suffice for atp produced through glycolysis alone without the krebs cycle or oxidative phosphorylation obviously this is because both processes need oxygen as we explained earlier, energy expenditure is coupled to ATP production. Accordingly, the heart muscle will be forced to less contraction or, in other words, less uh, um, uh, ionotropic action, low cardiac output, and this is because of the less ATP abundance. Let's have a look at this again. Let's rewind this animation again. So, as you can see here, in the lack of oxygen, beta oxidation is switched off and pyruvate produces lactate. In the presence of oxygen, the normal process goes on and beta oxidation and glycolysis will lead to ATP with less or uh, almost none lactate accumulation at all. Now, let's, uh, this brings us to the crown jewel of this chapter. Understanding the previous sections enables us to draw a metabolic profile of patients we see every day. This enables you to accurately determine the risks and plan your strategy in terms of myocardial protection and cardiopulmonary bypass. For instance, in hypertrophic ischemic hearts, um, uh, they rely more on glycolytic pathways, hence suffer a chronic state of low energetics and deficient ATP stores. Bearing this in mind, the surgeon might well opt to, opt to adopt things like blood cardioplegia, intermittent frequent dosing, 
delay pacing and inotropes as much as you can after cross clamp at extra. Also, a lot of surgeons opt to use intraortic balloon pumps preoperative in patients suffering severe coronary artery disease to protect them during induction of anesthesia. Let's look at another type, diabetic obese patients. On the other hand, rely more on beta oxidation pathways, which means that the heart is used to high levels of oxygen and can easily go into states of oxygen depth with the least error. We, will we all came across a diabetic obese patients whose surgery went straightforward yet ended up with an intraortic balloon pump postoperative and a high dose inotrope. One of the explanations is their metabolic status. Their metabolic status commands strict cessation of all metabolic activities during cross clamp. Few minutes of metabolism with no blood supply are sufficient to bring severe injury. This explains why some surgeons refuse to operate before the patient loses weight and controls blood sugar. Also, some surgeons might change their myocardial protection strategy to warm beating heart surgery to avoid falling into oxygen depth states. Understanding the previous concepts also explains some of the pathophysiological phenomena, such as myocardial hibernation, for instance. You can see this lovely uh, small panda having a nap, in which chronic ischemic state forces the heart to adopt a neonatal phenotype and recall relying on glycolysis more. This will lead to less energy production. Nevertheless, this is coupled with reduced energy expenditure as well. The heart enters into a state of power-saving mode, no structural damage is incurred in here, and revascularization restores the normal metabolic profile. Ischemic preconditioning is another uh, situation. Short, mild episodes of ischemia leads to a harmony state where ATP hydrolysis becomes slower. You consume less slower. Glycolysis under anaerobic conditions becomes even slower, leading to less lactate accumulation. On the other side, ischemic preconditioning also improves the ionic status and reduces calcium and hydrogen ions accumulation intracellular. It also improves resistance to reperfusion injury through activating survival kinases. We can also explain myocardial stunning partially by uh, metabolism. Four cardinal effects occur during the moderate transient ischemic insult. One, intracellular acidosis causing calcium overload. Two, this leads to conversion of xanthine dehydrogenase to xanthine oxidase by calcium-activated proteases and recruitment and activation of neutrophils. Three, this leads to production of free oxygen radicals which denaturates proteins and deactivates enzymes. Four, eventually, ultimately, all these effects lead to structural damage and excitation contraction are incomplete. Remember, number one, the triggering event was essentially acidosis, which is attributed to shifting to glycolysis instead of beta oxidation to face the uh, reduced oxygen to apply. Obviously, this will lead to lactate accumulation. Please note, these three phenomena were discussed partly in chapter one. Consider this a complementary explanation of these phenomena. Finally, this last topic is of mere exam significance. Throughout the chapter, all diagrams contain four cardinal uh, transporters, namely pyruvate dehydrogenase transporters, which transport pyruvate into the mitochondria, de designated with the green uh, uh, spot in here, as you can see. Uh, carnitine palmitoyl transferase, also known as carnitine shuttle, the blue one next to it, um, uh, which uh, transports um, um, uh, lactate into the myocyte. Glucose transporter four, which transports glucose into the myocyte. Also of note, there are two cardinal substrate fuel uh, uh, stores which back up our uh, supply of uh, substrate fuels. That is, um, as you can see here, the uh, glycogen uh, to store glucose and uh, uh, triglycerides to store fatty acids. But please note, this is only sufficient for a few seconds if you cut the blood supply. I tried to be as delicate as possible in tackling this subject. I hope we managed to address some of the day-to-day -day situations we encounter in our practice. Uh, I hope also you won't now give up on these metabolism or biochemistry MCQ questions if you see them. They don't come quite often, but they do uh, every now and then show up in the exam. I hope you find this useful. I will leave you now with this MCQ question to test your knowledge, and hopefully we'll meet in the next chapter. Thank you very much.